Hey everyone, in today's video we're going to have a look at scales of production. So what you need to know is what the different scales of the types of production are. So there's things like one-off or bespoke, batch, mass production, unit production systems, QRM and vertical in-house production. So first of all, to begin with, the whole idea of the term manufacturing, what that actually sort of like, and it's most basic form is essentially how do companies take the raw materials of something and then turn that into a goods or a product that is then sold to consumers at the end of it so the, the term manufacturing essentially just describes that whole process and obviously depending on what the product you're manufacturing is depends on the type of manufacturing that you'll do so when it comes to manufacturing there are a few different requirements a company needs to be able to sort out before they can actually set up and start producing what they need to do. So for some things, there'll be specialist buildings or places of work that are required. That may be certain kinds of equipment or things like that. Organization of people. So actually having people there trained, knowing what they need to do. Organization of your tools and equipment to so have everything set up, having everything you need. Any health and safety considerations. Obviously, depending on where you are in the world, there'll be some different health and safety considerations. Obviously, if you, you know, there's things like sweatshops where um, safety clearly isn't a very high priority whereas if you're manufacturing in Europe there are very strict health and safety regulations that are to be considered. Uh, communication systems, um, I mean you can argue that possibly communication is the single most important part of manufacturing because how do you keep everyone organised and keep everyone knowing what they need to do if you're not communicating effectively. Uh, and then basically some efficient like working methods of so understanding okay here's the thing we need to do what's the best way of going about doing it? And that's sort of what we're going to go over in the next few slides. So the first one is one-off production, also known as like bespoke. So typically for this, it's going to be a, a very highly specialist company or person. Um, the, the person doing it, or the, it'll be a small team that does it basically. So one or two workers, and they're going to be highly skilled in what they're doing because they're only going to do that one thing. There will be this constant communication with the client because you've gone to this person to make whatever you need to make. So whether that is like a wedding dress or a handmade piece of furniture, I think you're, it's not something you're just buying off Amazon or you're buying in a shop. You're getting this built specifically for you. So it needs to be for you, otherwise you're not gonna pay for it. So we've talked about uh, user-centered design in theory before. So there'll be that constant communication with the client to make sure that you're there producing what you want to produce. Um, there will be, the company will specialize in that particular thing. So if like wedding cakes, that baker won't be a general baker. They'll just do specific wedding cakes. There'll be things like furniture. So that company will only make specialist furniture, um, engineers, musical instruments, so on. So you wouldn't go to a generalist. It's, it's the difference between being a generalist that can sort of make an okay model of pretty much everything in that sort of field or a specialist that specializes in that one specific thing. Specialist materials are often required, so you wouldn't, if you get like a piece of furniture made, you wouldn't be using things like MDF or chipboard. You'd be using higher quality equipment, higher quality materials. Because of all of that, because you ha you're paying for this highly skilled person and this good quality material, the final product's going to be a lot more expensive. But the old saying, obviously, is that you get what you pay for. You're paying for this one-off bespoke thing. You'd, you'd expect the price to be high anyway. And because of that, obviously, you're going to get a high quality product at the end of it. So examples of that might be things like having anything handmade that you'd get. So like bits of furniture, that sort of thing. Wedding dresses, prototyping. Um, there are certain things like medical professions or um, aerospace. And also things where they only ever make like one or two of them. So your next one will be batch production. So this is the first time we start seeing a bit of what's called a production line. So batch production is where you're making items that are identical and there's going to be a small quantity of them. So a batch can be anything from two to say like 50 or 100. A batch can be quite a big batch, um, but it just means you're not gonna constantly just make that one item the whole time you'll switch to another item. So you have your production line. So each worker will have their one task that they're, they're doing. Maybe they can do one or two of the tasks. Um, the workers are semi-skilled or unskilled, so they, they're trained, they're, but they're not like highly qualified, highly, highly specialist like um, bespoke. So the workers need to switch from one part of the production line to another. 
So that's where you have like flexible working. So you, basically, once you swap to another batch of another product, they need to be able to do that one as well. Uh, Production can be changed quickly depending on what you need to do. So basically, if you take like Greg's or something like that, they don't just make sausage rolls all day. They'll make steak bakes, they'll make sandwiches, they'll make donuts. So you need to be able to change up what you're doing several times a day to be able to make lots and lots of different little bits. Typically, a lot of individual parts will be brought in from other companies, so they won't necessarily make all of every single part. So by that we mean things like bolting components, like bolts, screws, pins, those sorts of things. There's no sense because it will cost them more money to set up to make those parts, it's just easier to buy those parts in. And typically with batch production, um, if you take like the bakers for example, they'll make certain parts and then they'll move on. But it also may be, for example, um, games or something where they'll make a batch of it and they'll move on to the next one, or cars or wherever it may be. So really, most common examples will be bits of furniture, electrical goods, clothing, newspapers and that type of thing. So next you've got mass production. So this is where you've got a full automated production line. So each worker completes one task and passes it on to the next person. So typically here you've got semi-skilled or unskilled workers. Um, the cost of setting this up is quite high because you can have a lot of specialist custom-made equipment for it. Um, and then you'll have parts brought in again like we did before with bought in components. And here you're going to make things like mass-produced clothing, bikes, mobile phones, things that you see a lot of. Similar to mass production, you've then got continuous production. So the only difference really with mass production and continuous production is continuous production doesn't stop. So they're only going to make one thing. They're never going to swap between multiple products. Um, but essentially once production starts up, it just never stops until something happens and you have to actually just stop completely. So it'll be semi-automated, so there will be some... Um, machinery that's involved along the process as well. Um, you're going to have a mixture of skilled and unskilled workers depending on what the sort of thing you're going to do is. There is a high level of investment, similar to mass production because you've got this special equipment setting up. Um, you will have what's called quality control checks at every step. So we will do a theory on quality control and quality assurance which is essentially how do they make sure that because you're making thousands and thousands of the same product, how do you make sure they're all made correctly? So it's checks that they will have throughout each stage to make sure you're producing something well, something nice. So the kind of products you might have are some cars. Now, cars are quite a generic term because obviously you've got some much more expensive cars where they'll make batches of them or they might make one of them. But if you're talking about cars that you see a lot of or certain car parts, petrol or oil products, certain kinds of food products, paper products, washing powder, certain chemicals where you just need loads and loads of them, and things like battery pens and that sort of thing. So next you've got what's called unit production systems. So this is mainly used in textiles and what you've got, so if you look at the picture on the right, essentially your worker is going to stay at their station with their machine and all you'll have basically is garments, so textile clothing and that sort of thing will all come from overhead like rails to come to the person so basically the whole idea being that you don't need someone to get up and run to go and get their equipment to come back you don't need to hire a different person to sort of go in between workers to give them equipment so it speeds up the whole process while still keeping the good quality because people are just focused on doing what they need to do next you've got modular or cell production goes by the same same name so this is where you're going to have sort of a space set up with multiple different machines so you have um it's typically going to be CNC machinery, which hopefully you know stands for computer numerical control machinery. So they'll all be programmed to do a few different jobs in sequence. So basically there's not going to be very much human interaction. Obviously the uh, human interaction will be programming the actual machinery itself. But essentially it might be things like CNC lathes, mills, drills, grinders, lasers, um, printers, those sorts of things. But Basically, machine one will do its job and then a robotic arm will take that material and move it to the next machine and that'll do the next job and the robot arm will take it to the next machine and that'll do the next job. So it's all inside this little cell or this little module. So you've got four or five different machines and the material just pass between each four of the, like each one of those machines to make the next part, to make your final finished product. Now typically, if the machines are quite close together, robotic arms will move the material between each part because robotic arms can do quite a lot if they've got different kinds of grip methods to actually physically hold the product. You, they can hold very, very heavy products that humans can't, basically, because if, um, if you've got quite a heavy like metal product and trying to get a, a human worker to try and 
transfer that to another machine. One, you've got risk of injury, and two, they might do it wrong. So if you can have like automated robotic arms, we'll take care of that for you as well. If they're a little bit further apart, the machines, typically you could have automated... Um, oh, what's the word? Automated, like vehicles basically that will transfer it to machines depending on what it is so next we're going to have a look at like quick response manufacturing so the whole aim of quick response manufacturing is to make the lead time as short as possible so the lead time is basically how long does it take from when i've ordered something uh how long till i can have it so if you think like amazon well i mean we're kind of spoiled with amazon now as you press by now and pretty much everyone's like oh why is the doorbell not wrong yet where's my thing but i mean with amazon prime you buy something and then the next day it's here so the lead time is essentially from when i've ordered it when can i have it because in this modern society we're very very impatient so with quick response manufacturing there's a couple of things involved in that to sort of make that a little bit more doable so you've got vertical in-house production so p before we've talked about some of the methods where companies ha had bought in components where they bring in it's not worth their time making, making bolts and screws and pins and certain like generic things because they've got a set up for it they've got to pay all that investment to make it in in-house um but if you're a big company and you're doing it sometimes it is worth doing that and once you start producing those parts in your own company that's what vertical in-house production is it means basically you're not relying on other companies that might be out of stock um, they might go out of business so it does mean you've got control over the whole process. So it's, I mean, it's expensive to set up because you've got to set up a whole other part of a factory to do that manufacturing. But once you've got it set up, you're in complete control of everything that you've got. You've also then got what's called just-in-time. Now, you may have come across this if you do, did business studies at GCS, GCSE or you do business studies now. So this is the idea that rather typically what happens when you're not using a just-in-time method is... Companies make a product, or they make loads and loads of products, and they put them into storage, and then they ship them out to shops, and they stay in warehouses and factories. Just in time is the idea that they'll only manufacture it once it's been ordered. So rather than having like a stockpile of um, products, they only start to make it once they know it's going to be sold. The benefit of that is that you don't have to start paying for, like, storage so right you have to buy more warehouse space to store everything what can happen if you're storing things for too long is it can become obsolete so if you're doing like electronic products it might be that you've got something storing for six months and electronics move so quickly that that's not even you've not sold it yet but it's not even no one's going to want it anymore because the latest things come out it may be the same with things like football shirts for example you make so many of them and then the next season comes along and then no one wants last season shirt anymore so it's sort of wasted and ends up getting chucked away. So it's a much better way of reducing waste. The problem that you may come into is that certain things are out of your control because obviously you're just making it as it's ordered. So an order will come in and then you will contact all your suppliers. Normally it'll be automated. You don't physically go around and call everyone up. But so say someone said, okay, I want one of your products then all of the suppliers for all the parts you need get contacted for them to come ship to you. Now, if it's working perfectly, those parts come just as you need them. You make it all, you've got your finished product done perfectly. But if there's like a disruption in the um, delivery chain, so think things like the delivery driver shortage that we've had in the UK recently, think about things like COVID, all these sorts of things could disrupt that product, the um, delivery, which means your product's not going to get built on time, which means your customer's not going to be happy, so they might end up going elsewhere so there are big benefits to it but there are also because you're not in complete control at all times you're relying on other people so there's always that risk that it might not be as smooth a process as you want it to be and if you're like a big um high-end um, company you want that control next we've got flexible manufacturing systems so one of the big examples and they use it in the book quite a lot is toyota for this but the idea is that they, they use the modular or cell production that we talked about before with like CNC machinery doing a lot of the work. But the idea being is that you can change the product quickly depending on the demand. So if we take like Toyota, for example, they might be making a certain model because there's been a big demand for that certain model. And then suddenly, uh, next day, is a different models needed. So the idea being that you should be able to change all the parts you need 
really quickly. Now, there's this thing called single minute exchange dies. Um, now, the whole that term, single minute exchange dies, basically being it should take you less than 10 minutes to change the parts on the machines to make the other product that you need. So that's what it refers to is it should be a single minute, so nine minutes or less to change the parts to then make a whole different product again. And apparently Toyota, they were the ones that sort of pioneered this whole idea and they can do that and they can jump between making different models of cars depending on the amount of orders they've had and it's still going very strong to this day actually. So when we talked before about vertical in-house production and buying, um, making everything in-house, the opposite of that is buying in, getting bought in components. Now components is a term given basically um, to parts that fit into different elements of the design. They're all pretty much the same um, depending on what it is. Um, and some companies decide it's worth buying them in, some people decide it's worth making them. It depends on what, what scale of a company you are. But I just want to go through some examples of like standardized components and what that term actually means. So the term, the original like breakthrough of the standardized component was the, the British Whitworth screw in 1841. So before, like basically means that when you buy a screw, you're getting that same type of screw all the time. So the thread's always going to be the same. So it's always going to meet the size hole that you need or the size thread that you need. Um, the reason why that's helpful is that before then, if you're trying to replace certain parts, it's impossible because each company is making their own different screws or their own different threads, and you're just never going to get replacement parts. As time's gone on, we've all there's an understanding between a lot of countries and a lot of um, countries uh, to sort of like standardize what we're doing. So typically, we use, there's a metric international standards organization. So the ISO, the International Standards Organization, has basically adopted by most companies so that everyone's agreed to use this size screw or this size bolt. Or, so it just means it's a lot easier that everyone's using the same little parts and things can be replaced and fixed really, really easily. Um, that is a sect, of course, USA and Canada that still stick with their imperial system. Um, I won't go too much into that, but the imperial system is is dumb. There's a reason why pretty much everyone uses the metric system. The more people that agree to use the same system, the easier it is. But obviously, America and Canada have to be America and Canada. So, the common kind of standard components that are pretty much the same wherever you go. Is things like tires, plumbing fittings, door locks, audio connectors, batteries, fuses, fit kitchen units, printer cartridges, pen refills, memory cards. There's, I mean, that's not an exhaustive list. There are so many things where it's just you don't get different sizes of things. They're all just standard sizes. So it doesn't matter who you buy it from, you're going to get that size of a thing. So bought in components. So this is, as we said before, it's just easier for a lot of companies to just buy those parts in because otherwise you're going to have to set up another part of your factory to make all those individually where you could just buy 10,000 screws or 10,000 fittings or whatever it is that you may need. You can get something called sub-assembly. So this might be if you have things like hydraulic valves or gearboxes or electric motors, where what you essentially do is you buy in like a kit that has all the parts that can then be manufactured. So you might get like the CAD files for it so that you can then integrate and produce it all yourself. So you buy it in bulk, so it's a lot cheaper. Um, there's no, it's a lot more consistent, it's time saved, but it just means that it's one less thing for you to have to worry about as a, as a company. What can happen, and what actually interestingly has been happening a little bit, or will soon be happening with Apple as they're forced to do certain things, is when standards change, um, things come what's called obsolete. So what that means is obsolete means things will no longer, they don't make parts for it anymore, so you can't really replace it or fix it. So things like Apple um, get rid of their headset, the, um, the socket. Um, you are all probably too young to know life before HDMI for your consoles and TVs and that sort of thing, but they used to be something called a SCART cable. Um, Windows 10 causing compatibility issues on pretty much every bit of software going. Uh, new printers not accepting old cartridges. Uh, no disk drives, things like floppy disks, all these sort of things. So once, because um, standards do change over time anyway, and this slowly things are faded out, but there are some companies that try, like Apple are terrible at it. Apple, 
there is certain like ongoing legal things at the minute where Apple sort of being forced to use the same sort of charging port as Android and everyone else because then everyone's got the same charger and you can't start charging extra for it and then change it later. So just make sure you understand the whole idea is once standards change, like I don't imagine you've probably got anything that's got SCART cables on it anymore unless you've got some really old electronics knocking about. Essentially it was the cables that had like a white, red and yellow socket that would go into the back of a quite fat adapter that would then go into your TV. But obviously as new technology comes in, standards change and we all agree and then slowly we fade those out as well. So we're going to have a look at a few questions now. So these are a couple of long questions, so I'll go through the breakdown of it, then I'll to pause it and have a go at answering. Okay, so first one. So with reference to a product with which you are familiar, explain the different quality control, quality assurance procedures that will be suitable for each of the following production volumes. So one-off production and large-scale production, so they're making 100,000 units on an assembly line. So 28 marks. So first of all, We'll start at the top. First trick is to make sure you pick two products you know you can write about. Don't pick something and then you're like, I don't know anything about it. So for one-off, you can pick your coursework product. That's absolutely fine. So that's the first challenge, is making sure you pick something you can talk about. So 28 marks uh, to talk about two different things. So realistically, there's 40 marks for each. So 40 marks for one-off production, 40 marks for um, large-scale production. To break it down, Mark, so 40 marks, so seven points with an explanation to back it up. So really, you just have to seven points for each one of those as long as you can back yourself up with evidence as well. What I would do, I would start each one, so each one of production, large-scale production, I'll start each one by giving a definition of what quality control and quality assurance is as well. So 28 marks, pause the video. You can leave this up and get your textbook and have a go answering that in 28 minutes. Okay, so this is sort of like a run through of the sort of marking criteria it would give you. So it's got give a definition of what quality control, quality assurance is. So it's about making sure the procedures are put in place to ensure products are made to the right standard on time. It's done accurately. Examples of quality assurance could be CAD simulations, use of jigs, set of automated uh, machinery, quality control checks, we measuring gauges, checking um, samples, checking batches, checking they're okay. Uh, so then you're expected to refer to QA and QC throughout it. Uh, and then just make sure that you understand how it relates to the product. So just make sure, obviously, if you're doing uh, the big batch one and you chose, very say, for example, cars, and then you chose like a piece of furniture, a one-off one, don't mix them up and don't do ones that would be used in the one-off one because it's one person doing a job so they can spend that time. That obviously isn't feasible if you are doing uh say 100,000 so it's just the trick is just making sure you are using appropriate parts so next question the selection of materials and processes for the manufacture of products varies according to the quantity of the product required so two of the following scales of production explain what materials and processes could have been used in the manufacture of the product you have named so one off production batch production mass production so again 28 marks so again, the first trick is to make sure you pick two products you know about. So it tells you there's two. So it's giving you th there's three areas you can look at, but you're only doing two. So make sure you pick two. So one that's one one off produced, one that's batch produced, one that's ma uh, mass produced. Just make sure it's something you can write about. Again, you can use your coursework product project if you want. And the same breakdown as before. 28 marks for two things gets you 40 marks each. Break that down again, so you're after seven points with an explanation. So it tells you what it wants you to write about. So you've got seven points to bring up, okay? So you need to talk about the materials and the processes. So you've got to make sure you can name specific materials, not just woods, metals, plastics. You'd have to say, talking about, like, say, a sink, you've got to say it's like stainless steel. Okay, you have to be more specific. So you need to talk about their properties and then why they're suitable. So you think about the seven points. So you name the materials, you get your mark, and then back it up with evidence. Name the properties, give you another two marks and then back it up with evidence. So we've still got another four marks to try and get. So then you talk about the manuf manufacturing process. So that will take up the rest of the marks. And then you say why that's appropriate as well. You could use diagrams in the manufacturing process and, that, and label your diagrams. That would be a really good way of doing it because it's easier to do the manufacturing process diagram and then annotate as you go around. 
So 28 marks, pause the video, use a textbook, have your answer in, and then we'll go through the mark scheme. Okay, so examples. So one of products, so soak, handmade furniture, dining table, so like hardwood, teak, oil, uh, oak, something like that. So the fact that you've got things like individual uh, nice grains, really good quality. So you talk about how that'll be made. So that'll be like limited machinery, so it'll be made by hand, be crafted, uh, and then high cost. Batch product, product made machinery, so it could be furniture, but it's not going to be a one off. It could be uh, like office furniture, uh, like small chain outlets and things like that. And then volume 100,000. So anything that could be, say, for example, done CAM or CNC, anything that could be injection molded. Uh, or blow molded, anything like that. So again, like with both those questions, the key trick is making sure you pick the correct product to talk about, and then you understand the process. Uh, if you've got any questions, send me a message on either Teams or on my email, and I'll get back.